So, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the subject of prayer and how we pray. But today I want to look at a different subject that kind of is closely related to it. Why we worship. Why we worship. And last week, if you remember, I said that to pray in the Spirit was to pray from a life led by the Spirit of God. In other words, our desires, our affections, our purposes are in line with what God wants and being informed by the Holy Spirit himself. We said that prayer is relational and conversational, but also there can be times we pray with groans as the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray. And prayer is often so much more than we limit it to be. And that's the same with worship. So in looking at why worship, we're going to begin with this question, what is worship? What is worship? So worship in its most basic form is when we give our deepest desires, our affections, our time, thoughts, resources, energy and praise to something that becomes a high priority or the highest priority. So people worship themselves, people worship other people, people worship their children, people worship money, jobs, houses, objects. There's all kinds of things that people worship. But in so many ways and for so many people and in such subtle ways too, what we want, what we worship, can really get a grip on us to the point that those desires can become addictions that we never ever shake free from. As we're driven to do all we can to focus on and serve those things, whether we want to or not. But in the Bible, we see that worship has clarity and definition in its expectations and practice. <coughs> There's a very famous... Uh, songwriter, influential songwriter called Graham Kendrick and he has taught a lot of worship and he said this, worship has been misunderstood as something that arises from a feeling that comes on you but it is vital that we understand it's rooted in a conscious act of the will to serve and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, worship isn't just a feeling <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not just a feeling, it's a decision to serve and follow Jesus. And the worship of God is something that demands all that we are and all that we have, and yet is something that brings perfect wholeness and freedom. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah. Now, the very beginning of the Bible speaks of someone who is beyond the confines of time and space, namely God, who has no beginning and has no end, and yet out of eternity created time and space, into which he created the universe and then humanity in his image to reflect who he is. A wonderful uh, passage, verse in the Bible from a book called Ecclesiastes. It's not often looked at, but Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, it says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. So in that act of creation, God did something unique. In our finiteness, we can see there's something within us that's deeply longing for more, needing that space to be filled. And the temporary things of this world will not do it. The temporary might satisfy us for weeks, days, hours, or even just minutes. But there's something deep and eternal that we are reaching out for to fill that need. We yearn for something that's greater than ourselves, which is why there's always this inner longing to comprehend our eternal purpose and to know our infinite creator. Yet tragically, so many seek to find it in anything but God. Again, a lovely little verse, Psalm 19, verse 1, says that the heavens declare the glory of God. As you look into space, if you look into the universe, they declare 
the glory of God, that there is a creator. Creators, creation is speaking about the creator because the creator is greater than creation. And in nature, the evidence for God is seen. And yet, despite its obviousness, people still deny the existence of God. So in this passage in Romans 1 verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, although they were kind of aware of God, they neither glorified Him, they didn't honor Him, nor gave thanks to Him. They didn't thank Him for what He'd done. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. That's a powerful package that just basically says humanity sold itself short by going for created things rather than pursuing the Creator. And whether we recognize God or not, everyone worships and serves something or someone. It's true of everyone. People may not like that idea or notion, but it's true nonetheless. Because we're all trying to fill that eternal need of captivation which compels us in our lives. We all have a cause that we live for and that consumes us in some way. For some, it's absolutely recognizable and, and bright, burning bright. For others, it's just a little small thing, but it's what you live for. But this passage speaks of the consequence of rejecting God, of shortcutting His ways, of cutting Him out. There's an unwillingness by so many to recognize that there is a God who is the creator of the universe, despite looking at its incredibleness in every way, from the macro to the micro. But God says there's no excuse for this. The evidence is there. He's there. And so in what appears to be great human wisdom and intellect, and there are so many science and nature programs which we can watch that verify this, where God is not ever recognized as the creator and sustainer of all life. He's nowhere to be seen. Whereas the random Big Bang evolution is, and so this spills out into every other part of life. For without God, there's no purpose but randomness. Life is what we make it, there's no accountability. And morality is something we don't need, especially if God is not real. So everyone has their own morality and sense of right and wrong, or have nothing. So in the Garden of Eden, when Adam was in relationship with God and God had said not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Satan said this in Genesis 3 verse 5, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I said this before, that the thing that Adam and Eve failed to see was that God had already made them like Him. He'd made them in His image. To be like God, knowing good and evil, and become as Him, which was what Satan had also done and was kicked out of heaven for, that's what Satan wanted. He wanted to destroy what God had made. And the truth is this, when our eyes are not on God, they're on something else. And we're not looking at God, we're looking at something else. And the result of that will be that we will give ourselves over to things other than God. And the problem with Adam and Eve was that they didn't believe the best of God's intentions for them at this point, which was to protect them 
and give them an abundant life. Instead, they believed a lie, took their eyes off God, and suffered the consequence. So that humanity became fractured in its relationship with God from that time on, and has ever since been at war within itself as to knowing what its identity and purpose is here on earth. And so over the course of history, there's been a journey of restoration of humanity's relationship with God as God has revealed himself. And we see that God reveals aspects of his names, his nature, his character to different people at different times over history. And there was a point when he specifically delivers the Hebrew people from slavery to become the nation of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt under Moses' guidance. And he gave them greater direction as to who he was and as to who they were and how they were to live. He would be their God. They would be his people. The trouble was they struggled to be his people. They struggled to keep their eyes on him over the centuries, just as Christians have since the death and resurrection of Jesus. Let's have a look at what God told Moses to tell the people of Israel after they've been delivered from slavery. Remembering this is a nation who has no rules, no laws, no cohesion. It's been a, a people that have grown up into a nation under slavery. And so he says this in Deuteronomy 5. Moses summoned all of Israel and said, Hear Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. And then he goes on uh, further down in verse 5, 6. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. God wants the best for us. So he's saying, guys, you're going to get in trouble if you don't hear what I'm saying. But if you follow what I'm saying, you're going to be in much blessing. Now, as the creator, God has right to set the terms of how he is, how he's going to be, and how we as his people are going to be. And this can sound heavy. As we read this, it sounds heavy. You know, there's going to be punishment. But you've got to look at the punishment compared to the promises. If you don't do what's wrong, this is going to happen. It's small compared to if you do what's right, it goes on and on in goodness. And it came out of a heart of love and care to not only protect us, but so that we can gain all that he's got for us. All he wants for us. And he's got the right as the creator, the one who made us, to do this, regardless of what we think, because he knows best. There's, there's a beautiful passage in, uh, I think it's Isaiah, and it says, can the clay say to the potter, you know, what are you doing? What are you shaping me for? What right have you got to do? Well, the potter's the one in charge. God's the one in charge. When we don't like what God says, we're trying to say, I don't like your ways, God. I'll be God. Let me be God. That isn't how it works. And so to all those that don't want to know God or follow God, this can seem like a form of control or oppression. But the truth is, it's in not following God's ways or worshipping him. It's going to be that that brings oppression and slavery. And so we can look at lives where people are ending up in pain and crashing and addiction and all these different things. We're in thought process, we're in habit patterns we can't break free from. It's when we exchange the truth of God for the lie and we worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. So God is life-giving and the worship of God is life-giving, is revelatory, 
It's freeing. There's the analogy of you know, creators or designers' instructions, which is something that we live with every day. So the designer of um, the, or the, the ones who created the fact that we're going to drive on the left-hand side of the road, not the right-hand side, did it so that we would be safe. It's not going to stop every accident because then there's still rules to follow. But if we all drive on the left side in England, we're going to be safer than driving on the right side. Do you get that? Now also, we're going to be safer if we follow the highway code and drive at 30 miles an hour in a 30 zone than 60 in a 30 zone. It might seem oppressive that we drive on the left and we drive at 30 in a 30 zone, but it's actually going to give life and help longevity of life. Do you get to it? So although they're commands, they help save lives. And although give, God gives commands, it's to save life, to give life. Then Moses, in the next chapter of Deuteronomy, further clarifies these kind of rules with the heart element of it. And the heart element is love. So in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Let the motivation of your worship of God be love. Not duty, not slavery, but love. And so God reveals the heart motive of true worship. Love which is a sustaining motive. It is the same for any good relationship. It's the same for any marriage. The Bible says that God is love. God is love. Who He is is love in His nature and character. He's the real definition of love. And therefore, in loving God, we discover what real love is. In worshiping God, we discover who we are. See, when we look in a mirror, what do we see? We see ourselves. And we may or may not like what we see. But if that's all we look at, we'll never grow in our understanding of who we are. For we're made in God's image. It's as we look at Him, as we look to Him, we start to see who we are to become. We're to become like Him. That's the image we'll look like. And that will make all the difference to our lives because we're made to reflect Him. Not ourselves. Not other people. If we, re if we reflect anything else, we make that more important than God. We were made in His image for His glory to show His goodness, to please Him. Now, you may not know this. You may have heard of Moses and the Ten Commandments. But Moses had to give the people of Israel the Ten Commandments twice. So the first time, God calls up Moses to go up the mountain to give him the commandments. They were written on stone as a sign that he would be Israel's, people, Israel's God and they would be his people. But while Moses was up there getting this great revelation from God, the people down below had forgotten who God was. It had only been a few weeks. And they said, let's make something for ourselves to worship. And we'll call that God. So they said to Aaron, Moses' brother, can we have a golden cow, a golden calf? So Aaron gathered all the gold and he made a calf. And the people began to worship this man-made statue. How quickly hearts turn after other things if they're not focused on God. I wonder what our hearts are like. How quickly do we profess things for God and then maybe do the opposite? This was so offensive to God, what they were doing. He wanted to destroy them. And so Moses interceded and said, look, don't do this. You've, you've saved them. Help them understand who you're going to be. So God spares them. But those who took part in the worship were still punished. And so when you read of situations like this, you can understand why those who are meant to be worshippers of God receive the kind of response they do. And those who actually do worship God 
get the response they do. So God calls Moses up the mountain again for a second time, and Moses says, can I see your face? Can I see who you really are, God? And so in Exodus 33, verse 19, God says, I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, but you cannot see my face and live, for no one may see me and live. And then in 34, verse 5, so the Lord came down in the cloud, and he stood there in front, and he proclaimed his name. And as he passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. <clears throat> Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Now again, we look at this, we feel uncomfortable with punishment. But God is a God of justice. And what he's saying here is there's consequences if we don't follow God and consequences if we do. But the consequences if we do is to know his love, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, even when we rebel. If we are truly sorry. That's amazing. And so when people think of God, they can think we'll do whatever we want. But God isn't a mat just to be walked over. He's holy, he's majestic, he's awesome. One of his names is Jealous. It's a strange name for God, Jealous. But he's jealous not in the way we get jealous, we get selfish. He's jealous because he doesn't want anything to hurt us. He doesn't want us to be in a consequence of life apart from him. He wants us to experience all his goodness. To worship God is to acknowledge who he is and experience his faithfulness, love and kindness. To worship anything else other than the one true God is to come into a distorted reality of those things. People are looking for love, aren't they, in the world? And they're throwing themselves away in situations that are so painful that it's not love. But God's love builds up. So if we don't worship God, we come into this distorted reality of those things, a corruption of those things, a copy of false imitation that will lead to destructiveness both personally and to those around us. It's important to understand. And so that's why Jesus, in response to what's the most important thing to do, said the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. For in loving others, God's heart is found. In loving others, we discover God's heart for others. We diminish God when we worship the false. So to love God is to let your heart be captivated by God to let your mind be continually flooded by thoughts of God, to let your life be fully lived out for God. So when Jesus said, love God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, he means the full entirety of who you are. That's true worship. Now that sounds like a lot, but just as the Holy Spirit helps us how to pray in our weakness, so as we reach out to God, he will help us learn how to worship. Why worship? Because we've been created by God to worship. That's why we exist, so that we might know someone beyond us who's beyond description. Our Creator, our Father in heaven. And just as love is a decision, so is worship. I said at the beginning that to pray in the Spirit is to pray from a life led by the Spirit of God. The, We've given over our desires that we're being led directly into transformation. And to worship is to do the same. And so next week and, and the weeks after, I'd like to look at how we worship, who we worship. But I just want to end by praying and just to think on why worship. Let's just pray. 
Holy Spirit, we're so aware that you have given us life. You're the creator. We've all been on a journey to know you. And Lord, I thank you that we have been able to come into that relationship, into that understanding of who you are so that we can have purpose in life that we live to worship you. I pray, Lord, for anyone here that doesn't know you, that the eyes of their heart will be open to understand why we worship, to understand that you want to pour in your life into our hearts, pour in your relationship. So, Lord, over these days as we think about this question, why worship? Why should I worship? Who do I worship? How do I worship? May your spirit lead us into a deeper sense of worship. In Jesus' name.